So, and this um, uh, afternoon session, so the first panel uh, part of the Cultural Mobility Forum uh, will be focusing on uh, digital environmental sustainability. Uh, the format uh, of the session will be the same as before. So there will be one moderator, Irene. There will be two speakers, Pia and Gwen. And after there will be also a time for Q&A. So question and answer can be asked here. And you need also like to introduce yourself, also to introduce yourself uh, for um, people with visual impairment. And for those online, you can also post your question or your comment online, which uh, can be also shared to the moderator. So I wish you a very good session together. Thank you very much, Marie. Thank you and uh, great to see you all. Um, I will first introduce myself briefly. I'm Irene Garofalo, and uh, uh, on a visual level, I am uh, uh, a woman in my late 20s. I have dark, a bit wavy hair. Um, and uh, what can else, else can I say? I have glasses. I'm about 164. Uh, I am here today to talk about environmental sustainability, or rather to ask the questions about environmental sustainability. Uh, to our panelists and um, I guess uh, I've been busy with this topic for a few years now um, uh, because uh, with uh, the network that I represent, ELIA, that's a European network for high arts education institutions, so arts universities across Europe and beyond, uh, we've been looking at how to green the practices of cultural networks, also together with On The Move and our partners in the SHIFT project. Um, and so that's where I'm coming from. Um, and I'm very happy to welcome Gwendolyn Sharp. Um, she is the founder of The Green Room, a nonprofit organization developing strategies for environmental and social change in the music industry. And uh, Pia Rantala Koronen, um, as he works as director and advisor to the mayor in the city of Hulu. I hope I'm saying this correctly. And um, she was, is, was, was responsible for the bidding office of Hulu 2026, European Capital of Culture. Uh, but I thought I would leave our panelists to introduce themselves, actually. And so I'm gonna ask um, maybe first, Gwen, if you can say a little bit about yourself uh, and especially how your work connects to environmental sustainability. Yes. Thank you, Irene. Uh, hi, everyone. So my name is Gwen. Um, I am a white woman. Um, I have curly hair uh, in a ponytail, and I'm wearing a, a striped shirt. Uh, shirt. Sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, the Green Room is uh, an NGO that I founded uh, in 2016 after having worked for about 15 years in the music industry uh, in various countries. And um, we, uh, at the time, there were quite a lot of um, uh, festivals uh, working, tackling the environmental issue in the music industry. Uh, but uh, when I was working as a tour manager, I was working with quite a lot of musicians that were trying to address uh, the environmental issues in a quite a broad way, uh, but they were quite puzzled about how they could address that, where to start, and uh, uh, what was really the impact uh, of the music industry. Um, so maybe this is the kind of the paradox of our organization, is that we don't actually really believe in behavior change. Uh, we believe more in, in systemic change, and we really had the core of uh, environmental issues, uh, like environmental environmental issues at the core of our work but we really believe that the artists shouldn't uh, carry the burden so we are really there to assist them and also working with uh, the music venues with um, uh, european projects uh, networks uh, to try to see how we can uh, first have a, a dialogue about this and uh, to look at what we can actually implement to do better, but also being very aware of the different uh, realities. Yeah, thank you. Very important work that you do in the music industry. Um, and I would like to ask you, Pia, if you could do also quickly introduce yourself. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm Pia Rantala-Korhonen. 
uh, from uh, the beginning of this year, I have been working as a CEO of Oulu uh, Cultural Foundation, which is responsible for Oulu's European Capital of Culture Year 2026. Uh, I'm uh, 170 centimeters tall, mm -hmm. uh, dark, short hair, green eyes, 60 years. So this is my visual uh, outlook. Uh, I worked already for five years during the bidding process uh, as the head of, of our bidding team and uh, now we have still about five years to go until the big year begins in, in Oulu and maybe this can show you that uh, uh, capital of culture it's, it's not about a festival year it's about a transformation process, long-term transformation process, and uh, our main theme is uh, cultural climate change. So we want to combine both the, the cultural mental atmosphere in our city, but of course also the real uh, climate change issues, which is really important, especially in the north, where we can already see that, that the nature has changed. Yeah. And maybe just for our international audience could you say where Oulu is actually yes uh, uh, if you look at the uh, map of the Europe so Finland is is uh, up in the north and uh, in Finnish map uh, Oulu is uh, quite in the middle of Finland but because uh, whole North Finland is so sparsely populated area uh, everybody thinks that Oulu is in the north of Finland <laughs> okay thank you very much so it's one hour's flight from Helsinki five and a half hours with train, not too bad. <laughs> okay, good. So we all know how we can get there. Um, okay, so thank you very much. Uh, so what we're looking at uh, to discuss today uh, is really more the aspect of digital mobility and how that connects to environmental sustainability. Um, and this is a topic that's becoming more and more um, in on everybody's radar, I would like to say. Uh, I've had uh, multiple conversations lately in which this topic came up and um, and people are wondering, you know, uh, should we be greening our digital practices as well as our other practices and how should we go about that? And I hope with this panel, we can explore that a little bit further. Um, and I would like to start with the role of data because in um, climate action, uh, climate mitigation is always seen as one of the key elements. So climate mitigation stands for reducing one's negative impact on the environment. Um, and data collection tends to play an important role in that. First of all, you know, to have scientific backing for what we are actually doing and also to try and figure out if you're making process, if you're really reducing uh, your carbon emissions, for instance, or if that's not happening. Um, so data is an important factor. And, and my first question goes to Pia, uh, sorry, actually goes to Gwen, <laughs> uh, to ask her, um, you know, could you, could you say something about um, where people could find data on the digital carbon footprint of, of mobility activities? Um, it's actually a tricky question because uh, we don't have so many studies yet. Uh, and uh, even like real numbers, it's difficult to have, uh, you have very different uh, um, numbers depending on what you are looking at and the different methodologies that are being used. But if we look on a, on a global scale, uh, we know that um, um, the digital impact represents about uh, four percent of uh, worldwide emissions and uh, if you look at uh, numbers for countries so i have numbers for france uh, where i come from actually but it's it represents about 6.2 uh, percent of the energy uh, usage uh, it's about 3.2 percent of the uh, carbon emissions and it's about 2.2 percent of the water use and then if you look at uh, resources that are used to uh, make all actually the equipment and everything that we need for our digital use, it represents about uh, 4 billion tons 
of the resources that are extracted. So you might say like, okay, so 3.2% uh, of carbon emissions, um, that's about for one person in France, it's about 400 uh, kilos, which seems quite a small number. But if you look at the objectives of the Paris Agreement, which says that if we want to stay under 1.5 degrees, uh, that represents about uh, one fourth of the quota for one person in a year. So you see that it's quite a, a, a big uh, amount, actually, quite uh, uh, big numbers. And um, we often have this idea that uh, because it's uh, demat dematerialization, uh, that it's uh, invisible, so we don't see it as much as you would see, for example, on a festival field, all the plastic bottles, all the waste, um, that you think, okay, so you don't really know what uh, what it uh, represents, um, but the numbers are really are really growing, and uh, we know that by probably 2025, uh, it's going to be like now if it's uh, four percent worldwide, it's probably going to be eight percent, and it's in increasingly uh, growing. Um, so for us as uh, cultural practitioners, we don't really have uh, adapted uh, calculators to, to look into this. Uh, but for instance, uh, we made an experiment uh, with, uh, with my organization uh, and we worked on our website um, because we, we thought like this is a good way to start actually and to look at what it actually means to have an eco-designed uh, website. So we were starting to work on this uh, before um, before the pandemic, actually, uh, but uh, but then we had uh, we had quite a lot of time to work uh, further on that. And uh, while uh, doing that, we we managed actually to have a website that has uh, the weight of the pages is uh, 18 times uh, lighter than uh, an average uh, website. And um, it was also an occasion for us to tackle like uh, accessibility, but also at the same time as having lower energy impacts uh, to think how to make our website the most accessible possible. And also uh, everything uh, relating to um, uh, protection of, uh, of privacy. Mm -hmm. And this is where also a lot of data are taken uh, by your website, but you don't necessarily know that this is happening yeah. and this is also using quite a lot of energy that you, probably you don't uh, you don't have to okay so if i understand you correctly um first of all there's a lot of data that we use and that we are not really aware of of how it's being measured um and at the same time uh, one of the the biggest reasons to tackle this this um, digital footprint is that there is this big increase uh, predicted for the coming time. Um, and so my I, I, one follow-up question for you is, um, of course, today we're looking really at mobility and cultural mobility. And so how, how would you define that the urgency of actually having a conversation about, um, about the, the digital carbon footprint in this mobility um, context? Um, well, building on what we've heard also on previous uh, panels and about this uh, acceleration of values, um, like for instance, when we were talking about uh, dance band performance on online and that you actually need to have good quality equipment at home, uh, the impact of um, uh, the, the biggest uh, carbon footprint of uh, digital use is actually the uh, manufacture of all this equipment. Like the more you will go with uh, a new phone every year, a new computer, the bigger, uh, more immersive experience. This is like uh, requiring more and more energy, more and more resources to be made. So it's actually this, uh, it's also this acceleration in, in this sense that uh, we really need, need to address. And I think this is very, um, um, very present uh, in the music industry, especially. Uh, there were many issues uh, already uh, with dealing with uh, um, the digital before uh, COVID. Um, but there was an interesting study also that was made uh, in the US by a researcher 
from MIT called Kyle uh, Divine. And um, he was showing, like he, he drew the whole history of uh, recorded music and was showing that at first it was always, um, it has al always been a major uh, exploiter of natural and uh, human resources. Like in the 20s, you had all the shellac, uh, which is like an insect based uh, resin to, to make the ancestors of vinyls. Um, like vinyl production also uh, in the 70s was um, exposing workers to uh, toxic fumes and to pollution. Um, and now you have also um, like the um, child labor in, in mines uh, for extraction of rare metals to make our, our phones, our, our computers. Um, at the same time, you have also all the, the habits that we have as music consumers. Um, there was a report that I found really interesting that showed that people actually, 77% that uh, use YouTube, use it to listen to music, which is actually, uh, you have a video, but no one is actually um, uh, watching that. So it's also like kind of rethinking our ways and things that are kind of automatic and you don't think that it actually has an impact, but it has. Mm -hmm. So it's also about this, uh, this mobility of of uh, works um, and it has been said also before we have this idea that it's really accessible that everybody can can really uh, access that but uh, if you look also at the numbers uh, it's 40% uh, of uh, the population uh, that doesn't have access to internet and that's about uh, 10 billion people in in South Asia and uh, I think around 800,000 people uh, in Africa, so it also means who do you reach and how mm -hmm. how do you reach uh, yeah. people? And I can continue after, but maybe one <laughs> one more thing to be yeah, also on maybe um, a brighter side. But um, I see also a lot of uh, interesting uh, new experiments. And for instance, uh, so I'm not a specialist of blockchain NFTs, but I know of a project which is uh, which I like very much, which is using actually the blockchain technology to trace um, the transparency of payments for artists, for production. So basically, uh, to make it very simple, when you go to a festival, you have this, uh, you know, the little cashless thing. And in real time, when you buy your beer, for instance, or an orange juice, uh, you will know like one zip that you get will go for the artist, one goes to the production, one goes or two uh, goes to, I don't know, the organization, and it helps to have this transparency, but also it helps to understand why sometimes you go to a festival that is free, but you pay eight euros for your beer, or probably mm -hmm. 20 if you're in Finland, but, <laughs> 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 but then uh, it's easier mm -hmm. for the audience to understand where the money goes. And also with this cashless that you have so many issues now that it's difficult to get your money back or you never know, then it also allows the audience to maybe make a donation either to the artist or to the festival or maybe to an environmental cause also. So it's not that black and white, but, but it can be also very, very constructive and useful. Sorry, yeah. I talk a lot. No, no, no. <laughs> that's why you're on the panel. So, um, so thank you. And what I hear is that uh, when we think about the sustainability of digital mobility, we also need to think not just about the mobility of people, but also really also about the mobility of artworks. And uh, as a sector, um, it might be useful to start mapping out wh where the ma major sources of digital footprints are, um, because um, you know maybe for the for the music sector, it's really the streaming that is is a big source of emission. But for uh, performing arts or um, visual arts, it can be something else. So having this conversation and trying to explore that, I think, is very important. And you touch, of course, also on the fact that um, the environmental sustain sustainability also closely relates to inclusion and other aspects that I know will also come back in our next panel. Um, but that's very important because we can't really tackle one thing um, without completely forgetting about inclusion and fair pay and all these kind of um, other topics. But I will now give the word to Pia because um, 
the, the, the capital of culture that you're organizing is such an interesting initiative. Um, and I know uh, it can be a great opportunity to stimulate conversation about uh, certain key themes and environmental sustainability is really high on your radar. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how it will be included in the program and especially if you're also considering the digital aspects in that and if you have any digital mobility, digital cultural mobility plans. Yeah, well, uh, to start with, uh, we have uh, an interesting uh, project going on called the most sustainable European capital of culture. It started already during the bidding process and already this summer we will uh, collect data from local events about the emissions and, and how they deal with, with uh, all, all green things and, and uh, try to make everything so, so uh, responsible way that it is possible so that we can compare uh, with the coming coming bigger events. Of course, uh, uh, the number of events will be much more bigger in 26 than what it is uh, this year. And uh, if we think about the total number of the emissions in, in 22 compared to 26, I'm afraid that there might be more emissions still in uh, 26, but maybe you have to count them per, per visitor or, or have some other kind of, of metrics that how you count them so that it's mm -hmm. it's fair play. Uh, already in our bid book, we promised that uh, we will produce uh, more than 70% of all our cultural program in a hybrid way so that it can be read uh, live coming to Oulu or some other spots in, in our road area. So it's not only about uh, city of Oulu, we have a very broad area in the northern uh, Finland, uh, in total 33 municipalities starting from the Russian border uh, to the Swedish border. And uh, Oulu is the only big city in the area, so most of the area is quite sparsely populated area, so it's also quite practical that uh, the program can be, can be visited digitally so that you don't have to travel uh, long distances in, in our own area. And of course, for people who are interested in our cultural program who live in, in other countries, they can uh, maybe have a part of the program in digital mode and, and maybe they will still visit, travel to Oulu and, and have experiences also in, in our region. Uh, uh, part of the, uh, the European Capital of Culture process is uh, nowadays also evaluation and, uh, and uh, research, and we are making that uh, together with the Cultural Policy Research Center Kupore, which is the only one in Finland. And uh, we try to uh, find good practices from uh, our colleagues in, in uh, other parts of Europe, and especially from the city of Lahti, who was uh, last year the European Green Capital, and uh, uh, they have uh, really good data and uh, uh, good good practices that uh, how to make also cultural events in a green way so that we can have less emissions and still be more active in, in culture. But about the inclusion, I must say that uh, uh, because uh, I belong to the generation who has uh, studied and, and started the working life uh, without any digitality. Uh, that there are many, many people also in Finland and in our area who are uh, not used to use any digital devices and maybe are not able to do that. For example, my mother-in-law who is uh, 91, uh, those uh, iPads and, and uh, mobile phones, they don't recognize her fingertips. Mm. You can you can uh, uh, see that when you become older, that happens to your your skin uh, is so thin that that uh, the devices don't understand that. Hey, this is human being who is touching them, <laughs> and uh, uh, that is quite paradoxical because if I think that who needs digital accessibility to cultural events most, they are those people who are not able to visit uh, theaters or concert halls. 
So it would help a lot. But I think that uh, here we need also uh, some uh, positive development uh, in those enterprises who are making making uh, uh, all devices for us, so that they really understand that they are also customers, those older people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and it goes back to what we said also in the earlier panel about the conversations that we shouldn't only talk among ourselves, but also try and get our voice towards people that are actually creating the technology and owning the technology. That's a very good point. And I wanted to ask you, um, I don't know if you're already that far since it's only 226 that the capital of culture will happen, but um, have you already thought of some sort of design principles for your hybrid offer? So how you will integrate this sustainability aspect into that and perhaps also a little bit of the inclusion without going too far in that because I'm afraid <laughs> for the next panel otherwise. Yes, uh, already in the bidding process when we uh, had our first open call for the cultural program, uh, we had a form for all proposals so that uh, uh, people had to uh, tell us about uh, how they will make the cultural climate change in their program and, and environmental issues are part of that cultural climate change which we are waiting for all the program proposals and we will have the next open call in uh, October this year and uh, we hope that uh, we get also new ideas from, from uh, uh, cultural professionals and, and other people who are making the proposals that how can we make this and of course we are waiting uh, enterprises to to make new innovations for cultural uh, professionals too so i think that uh, we can't make uh, the change alone in the cultural branch we need also the technological part in our society to be our partners and, and make new innovations together yeah, I think that's a very good point. It's about also not working in a silo in the cultural mm. sector. We're really looking also beyond uh, ourselves and at other ex fields of expertise. Um, and I think that that's very important. It's very important uh, because we can create all the solutions ourselves, but we do have some agency in, in our choices that we make. Um, and maybe uh, I wanted to give the word back to Wen. And I don't know if you have any thoughts about the hy hybridity, hybrid formats, um, because hybrid formats are kind of seen as the future and they have so many benefits to them because, uh, you know, you can reach out to a much broader group at the same time. Um, at the same time, you can meet in person. You, there's, there's almost... I mean, I have to say at Ilia, we, we look at it sometimes and we say we can't avoid hybrid. Hybrid is, is a bit the future. I'm not sure if I'm right, but that's a little bit how we look at it. But at the same time, hybrid comes with different sustainability problems because you don't only have to look at the in-person sustainability, but also at the digital sustainability and how you combine that. So I wondered, Gwen, if you had any, any thoughts on that. Um, but especially because we are actually taking part in the hybrid uh, events now. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, I think uh, um, I'm uh, since uh, COVID actually that so many people now are, are used to having a Zoom or attending a hybrid uh, event. I think it really changed the mindset of uh, people. Um, three years ago, it was like normal to go to Brussels for a two hour uh, meeting to fly there, to fly back. I mean, there was. And now I, I doubt people, or at least they will think about it and maybe not do it. So this is the possibility for people that are maybe close to, to attend the, the event in person and the ones that are far away that wouldn't uh, necessarily have other things to do in the city. They can still, uh, still attend and we can still have like uh, very meaningful uh, meetings. Um, through through this way uh, but what we tend to see now in the music industry is like because so many people experienced uh, having uh, online concerts or online per performances so now you get the ones that are 
um, in person with uh, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people. And that already represents like 80% of the carbon footprint of the, of the event. And then the concert is also uh, live broadcasted. And then there's no limit. You can really reach uh, millions of people. So then the impact is again like really big so it's also a way like if you it's it's a it's a matter of scale it's a matter of scale for events it's a matter of scale of the audience that you reach it's always this uh, this balance that you have to have so now um what i'm seeing is more events that started to to tackle this issue that decide to have also a limited audience online and also it allows to have a better experience because people can also exchange between them or to have a special um yeah an experience actually not just people watching in front of their of their screens but uh, sharing something also uh, with the artist having a special moment before or after like this uh, this kind of practices okay so uh, what you're saying is it's a bit of an experimenting with the format and trying to find ways that are um more sustainable and can the technology choices also impact that or are we quite limited in that still what do you think you know when you have to choose teams versus zoom or something like that yeah, yeah. um well it, i think it was said before that actually uh, all the platforms that we have we don't really have much choices right now uh it's uh, it's really in the hands of the gafam and it's really difficult also to to monetize uh, to get uh, for the artists to, to get paid. If you just look at uh, Zoom or other um, uh, online conferences tools, uh, sometimes you really have to choose your battles because you will have something that will be uh, open source, uh, that will uh, really protect your, your data, your privacy, but maybe they won't be the greener. Mm -hmm. And then you have the, the ones that are actually uh, green, but then uh, in terms of uh, protection of data, or then they won't be. So it's difficult to have both. And I think that's something we are facing with uh, all the kinds of decisions that we are taking when you try to be uh, environmentally sustainable. Sometimes you have to make compromises with other things. And so, so yeah, it's just yeah. many layers. <laughs> A lot of layers, exactly. So um, I'm also kind of wondering about how the digital uh, footprint relates to other uh, sustainable, um, sorry, environmental footprints, uh, for instance, uh, and that's also really related to, to the hybrid format. So we have um, travel footprint and um, building footprint. And I had a question from someone um, lately uh, who asked me, you know, if we focus so much on the digital carbon footprint and reducing that, don't we forget about other sources of emissions that are also really big? And so um, I would like to try and address this question and explain the difference between maybe um, addressing your travel footprint and your building's footprint and why it's important to also look at your digital footprint. So um, would either of you like to go on this question? Uh, well, I don't have any any data. It's just a feeling that I I think that uh, it is uh, more sustainable if you are trying to to have big audiences for your cultural offer uh, to get audiences uh, in a, a digital form because uh, uh, having millions of of visitors to all in in North Finland, I'm sure that it would uh, make huge amounts of, of emissions if people are flying from around the world and, and we don't even have that much hotel rooms for them so <laughs> that it's better that part of them are, are in some other parts of the world uh, and at the same time uh, i come back to the uh, inclusion question because uh, uh, still uh, more people in the world globally has access to uh, internet uh, than uh, have possibilities uh, to travel by plane. 80% of inhabitants in the world have uh, never ever uh, traveled by plane. It may be hard for us in the first world to, to remember and understand that, but this is the reality in the world. And so if we are uh, 
talking about but uh, uh, equal opportunities to to uh, access in cultural events so i think that still uh, uh, digitality has has uh, uh, better possibilities to give that possibilities to everybody or even to more people okay yeah thank you gwen would you like to add to that um, yeah, I think it's very interesting uh, that you got asked this question because I usually get uh, people telling me like, uh, oh, going digital is actually going green. And, um, and there, there again, we don't have so many, uh, so many studies, but um, there was a, a comparison between a, um, a performance taking place uh, online uh, using a virtual reality, so like a two hour performance. And it was compared to a, a performance in a medium sized uh, theater in a city center. And the impact of the online conference was actually bigger than the impact of, uh, of an actual event, even if people uh, didn't necessarily use uh, only uh, public transport. So it's sometimes maybe the it's a matter of deconstructing some uh, some some ideas and some maybe misconceptions about uh, how things are but also to really understand where our where our footprint uh, um, comes from and maybe uh, it's also important to go uh, beyond just uh, carbon obviously uh, climate change is a, is a very uh, urgent uh, issue, but we have also all the other issues like uh, um, the water footprint, the uh, biodiversity loss and all these uh, things that need to be addressed. So I can understand also that some people might say like maybe it's too much focus on this carbon thing and we have to think more uh, globally and to see how people there again are affected differently uh, where they are in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point that we shouldn't just think about carbon. Carbon is the easiest one in the sense that a lot of people now know what it is and are measuring things. Um, I think, I mean, I think another aspect that might be worth considering is that um, I also looked at the, at the numbers really quickly. I Googled them before the session um, and of course, on a global level, our major emissions, as far as the current calculation goes um, and how correct they are, uh, it it's still is in transportation, for instance. But as we were saying, that the digital is increasing so quickly that it's also important that we kind of, while we are developing the digital, that we right away develop it right and not cause an enormous new problem that we'll have to deal with in 5, 10, 50 years uh, because we have kind of been blinded by, by the fact that, you know, uh, we are only looking at travel. But I think personally, really, uh, when thinking about climate action, it's important to think holistically and really try to make everything that you do greener. So that's maybe a little thought from me. Um, so I would like to, since we're thinking a little bit in the future, <laughs> I would like to ask you a bit of an ideal question, an ideal scenario question. I would like to start with Pia. So if you think like in, in five, 10 years from now, um, what, what should we aim for in terms of, of digital sustainability and cultural, mobili and cultural mobility? Um, so what's your ideal scenario? And maybe how do you hope that the capital of culture could contribute to that? Uh, well, uh, maybe I would uh, like to change also our education system so that uh, uh, people in uh, different stages of education from, from the very beginning to universities uh, get new kind of knowledge so that uh, all the digital uh, cultural offer could be also high quality. We all remember those first uh, screenings of, of uh, in the beginning of the pandemic when, when everybody took their stuff into internet and it was uh, uh, not all so high quality. And uh, we have now uh, plans to start new education for uh, hybrid producers for cultural events and uh, uh, 
of course, we has to have to have those enterprises who are making those devices, uh, making the change together, so that we don't have to buy new uh, new computers and iPads and phones every second year, so that uh, they could maybe be in use as long as possible, and you could maybe have them them uh, uh, reused, recycled in a proper way when they are not working anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we need uh, help of researchers so that we are not uh, uh, thinking about, uh, uh, you know, a level of uh, wishes and, and, and hopes, but what we really could have uh, uh, hard, hard facts about that. What is, what is uh, greener and, and uh, maybe you have just uh, uh, different kind of ideas of, of green things which are not really true mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So, but uh, the fact is that uh, we, the cultural professionals, we can't make uh, the big change alone. We need the whole society to rethink the system that uh, what the digitality means in the future. Mm -hmm. I hear in what you say also, and we talked about it yesterday a little bit, <laughs> but uh, that the concept of maybe STEAM collaboration, yeah. which stands for uh, science, technology, arts, now I'm saying it's wrong, engineering and maths, that's the right, uh, the right term, um, so that we need to work with the arts with other uh, sectors with other expertise because this is a problem that is much bigger than us um and i know you actually had some some steam project i guess this also connects to the skills mm. question from the previous panel a little bit because it's also about getting steam skills perhaps mm. uh learning to look at topics from different perspective and collaborating from with people from different expertise uh, yes, we have in Oulu some STEAM schools for children and uh, we are going to have a new children's cultural center which will be made by the ideo ideology of uh, STREAM so that we are adding the reading to the right. traditional mm -hmm. STEAM ideas. Yeah, and we know that communication is key, so that I think yeah. that's a very good idea. Um, when? What's your ideal scenario? <laughs> scenario? <laughs> um, no, I totally agree with, uh, with what Pia mentioned, and uh, about uh, especially about the having more sustainable uh, consumption uh, choices. Um, I think also we we need to, uh, to address that with the funders, um, because I see a lot of funding opportunities now tackling either the digital shift or. Um, the green transition or um, um, equal opportunities. And I think everything is so interlinked that we really need to, to have funders uh, propose uh, uh, funding schemes for, for that and to help also develop really uh, alternatives to, like if you're an artist now and you don't want to be on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, TikTok, but, What's the alternative uh, for this? And it's like the system is uh, is uh, really made on that, and that you need to have this exposure. So uh, it would be really interesting to have something, and maybe more also uh, locally developed and um, more either European based or African based. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's what I wish for. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the funding, of course, is. Is something that we could work together as a sector it's really big on a lot of our minds and um, i know there are efforts now in trying to make also cultural funding more sustainable um and that is also not easy <laughs> i don't know if you have any thoughts on that i mean you just came through a whole process of of getting the capital of culture and I mean, in this, you were selected, I guess, also partly for the green aspect. Um, do you have any any suggestions, maybe, for people? I think that uh, maybe one of the reasons why Olu won the competition was that uh, uh, Olu is uh, seen as a possible a platform for combining uh, high tech, which is very big part of our our uh, 
enterprises in, in our region and, and also our university so that we put culture and high tech together. And I think that maybe something which we can see already in 26 will be some new forms of culture, something which is made in a total different way, not so that we have the analog way to make culture and then we put it into a digital form but there is maybe some new genres uh, becoming mm -hmm. into the cultural field do you have some examples in mind or is it just a hope i think that something which has happened in the game industry i think that the game industry uh, could maybe be transformed in a more artistic uh, mode so that mm -hmm. it could be maybe considered as art in 26 like uh, what has happened for example to comics which was just uh, entertainment earlier now it's uh, part of uh, literature and, and art mm -hmm. okay thank you and um i would like to go back to the mobility of artists <laughs> and i would like to ask when if you have come across in your in your years of experience working with um with environmental sustainability a really good examples of how we could do a more greener type of mobility online or offline i i usually don't like to answer this question oh. because i don't <laughs> think there's like one uh, there's not one solution that uh, that might work and it I, I have examples, but it's like, uh, it's not probably not working for everyone or it's just one. Uh, uh, but uh, currently I'm working with um, uh, a band which is doing uh, improvised music and they used to tour a lot in Japan. And uh, some of them decided that they don't want to fly anymore. It's their personal choice. And, um, but they still want to keep the connection with, uh, with their, uh, with the musicians that they met in Japan. So they decided that they will ask the band in Japan to tour and to play their own uh, piece. And they will tour uh, in France or in Europe and play their piece also. And this, this exchange, there's also this fair payment between them. But it's also, it, this is happening because they could travel before and because they actually went on a flight before. So um, that's, um, that's one, uh, one thing that, uh, but I, I actually like this project because it's very uh, experimental also, and we don't really know where, where it's going. Mm -hmm. And if you, I mean, I think a lot of people that are connected today uh, are thinking about uh, maybe organizing themselves digital mobility or uh, connected to other people organizing digital mobility and so my question um well to you but also to pia is do you have any because you say there's not one example that you can give that just applies to everybody and i think that's completely right but at the same time it is nice to have some form of of guidance some sort of things that it's good to keep in mind when you're trying to make your um, mobility and especially your digital mobility more sustainable. And I mean, uh, I worked on on the shift project. I said it before that looked at the the, the, um, the cultural networks, and we created some guidelines for cultural networks that could give them like a, a, a step to step approach or at least some guidance on what they can do to start becoming more environmentally sustainable and so do you have maybe <laughs> some something that could be applicable to everybody and then maybe everybody can can form it in the way that works for them mm -hmm. shape it in the way that works for them yes um we are actually currently working on uh, uh, producing a guide for uh, good uh, good practices for uh, sustainable uh, digital practices in the music industry. Uh, so we are digging into it. It's taking a lot of time and a lot of research. So um, yes, but um, I think I, one of the best uh, practices that you can have is what you, you said before. It's just to keep uh, your computers and your phones the longer you can. That's uh, already a very, very big uh, 
yeah, big uh, lever to to change uh, our practices. And uh, on on maybe because we always talk about uh, artist mobility, but on ourselves uh, as uh, cultural operators. Now I see more and more like uh, programmers, for instance, that uh, used to go every year to Womex, to uh, South by Southwest, and now uh, they rely on their network, local network, and they have like one or two persons going there, but then they exchange and they go more locally to those fairs, and then they, they exchange uh, digitally. So that's also a good uh, practice, I think, to try to change our habits and maybe not to go everywhere all the time although mm -hmm. of course it's needed but uh, maybe not not always yeah well that's interesting and it's interesting to figure out what type of digital connections will be efficient to that regard because you know you can ask your local network to participate somewhere and then maybe um, give you some input back, but there's also ways of participating digitally and uh, we're really in an experimental stage. We've seen it in, in our work. We've also experimented a lot in the past two years with digital conferences, with hybrid conferences, and it's really, um, you know, it's, it, it's experimental and I feel like we should also embrace the experimental aspect of it. And I would like to say maybe yeah, maybe one more question to Pia because um, another issue, and I wonder if if the digital could help with that. Maybe I'm going a little bit beyond the environmental sustainability, but you know, certain regions are also seen maybe as more peripheral. Um, and and you say that your city is seen as one of the most northern cities of Finland, and I I wonder, you know, how how the digital could maybe help and maybe not help in that sense, to keep the connection going? Uh, I must say that uh, in some ways, the pandemic uh, helped us during the bidding process uh, because we didn't have to travel everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, we had meetings with uh, all those uh, 32 municipalities in our region and also dozens and dozens of partners around the Europe if we would have traveled to meet them, everyone, we wouldn't have enough time to do that. So uh, it is efficient and, and it's also a more sustainable way to, to make the collaboration. But if we are talking about uh, culture and art, I think that it's still uh, more sustainable that uh, artists or a group of artists travel to the audience than the huge amounts of audience uh, travel to the one spot where the artist is performing that's interesting and i guess i guess it depends on exactly <laughs> what is being performed and who is traveling and yeah, uh, yeah. But i guess in, in in some cases that must yeah. be true and also uh, we have one flagship uh, called peace machine and uh, we have been discussing that uh, maybe uh, we are not making an immersive uh, a piece of art, which would be a huge amount of materia, but uh, instead we will make it uh, in some kind of digital form so that uh, it can be realized in different spaces uh, around the Europe. And uh, okay. you don't have to have uh, many cars carrying uh, different kind of devices and, and uh, exhibitions. and. Huh? That's like a really that. good example, actually, yeah. of, uh, of a different kind of mobility. Um, I think we have to round up. And uh, what I what I hear from from what our discussions is that um, there's a lot of positive opportunities in in the digital mobility, but that we should also be very mindful about the way we develop it further and be mindful of the environment while we do so. I would like to thank you both very very much for your. Uh, contributions um, and I will give the word to the floor for further questions. So a round of applause for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So my name is Stefan. I work for uh, Chico Strada. I am a white Mediterranean man in his 40s, early 40s.
I have a black hair, black beard with some white hairs, and I have a mustard shirt. Um, so let's play a game of pretend for a second. Let's pretend that I am a policymaker working for uh, a national ministry and in a European country that I know a little bit about digital art and culture, that I know a little bit about being eco-conscious and eco-responsibilities, but I don't know much about the connection between both of them. What would be your first recommendation, advice, suggestions to make, to make me change and act quickly? That's a very good question. And as advocacy officer, I would love to have the answer to that. So maybe Thank you. would one of you like to respond? <laughs> Stefan, um, I need to think about that. <laughs> no, I don't have a straight answer now. Do you? Maybe I could uh, recommend that uh, you could take part in our hybridized festivals. <laughs> and maybe later on you could uh, come and visit our city or other municipalities in our area when you have had some experiences in digital form. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just talking yesterday with someone about the importance of really showing also the policymakers what it is that we're doing to have them understand it better. And so in that sense, when we have uh, good, good experiments of digital mobility that is sustainable, and it, it would be great to also invite some policymakers and have them be present and experience that themselves. But uh, yeah, that's my little two cents. So I don't know if there's any other questions. I can now. I, I've been ah. thinking. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say that uh, I think they should really uh, consult the actors on the criteria that they might want to implement. And there's a great example from uh, Creative Carbon Scotland, actually, that uh, started to implement uh, the uh, eco-conditionality of public funding. Uh, but before they actually really thought about what would exactly be the criteria. And actually, this was never uh, implemented but the actors managed to lower uh, their carbon footprint by 50 percent and now after some years of experimenting they are going to implement uh, the eco-conditionality of funding to reach the goals of uh, carbon neutrality so i think sometimes maybe policymakers tend to uh, take those decisions a bit too quickly and not to address the right issues and, uh, and not to consult on either environmental, but also like social and territorial criteria that really need to be balanced. And uh, that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa. I work for Flanders Arts Institute. I'm a tall, white, blonde, early 40s uh, cultural oper operator. And I was actually going to answer your question, but it's in the same line as yours, is that um, we noticed in, in Flanders, at least for structural subsidies that you have now as an organization applying for five years structural funding to tick the boxes, let's say, for having a diverse um, board, uh, implementing fair practices and fair pay within the organization. And I'm sure that within five years, and I hope at least that we will also have to implement um, sustainability and green conduct within the the whole functioning of your organization. So I hope that um, funders, policymakers will also ask us to respond to that and that we have to uh, implement those, uh, let's say, rules within our own organizations. That would be uh, a good start for, for, for working together, actually, us as organizations and then together with the, the public funding policies. Yeah. Voilà. Thank you. Yeah, I have seen it happen a little bit at European level. So uh, there's hope for that. At the same time, it's also important to keep in mind the resources necessary to green an organization. So hopefully there will be maybe some extra funds to do that. That would be a nice addition. Are there any other questions?
I'm going to try and answer for your question, Stefan. <laughs> Um, I'm Matthew Covey. I'm a uh, tall uh, male with short hair and glasses um, of indeterminate age. Um, I think that one of the interesting and important things about the work that's being done in the cultural sector is that this is a sector that cares about these topics far beyond the actual scope of our impact on the topic. And in that sense, what matters most about the work that's being done here isn't the actual carbon we're saving because compared with other industries it's minimal but it's a laboratory for how to do that that can be modeled that can be modeled for other industries and it's also visible for other industries so if you're a policymaker i would want you to watch what's being done here not because it's like oh great you solved it good but it's this is being done here for the purpose of being an example for the rest, for other industries. I think I'd want you to know to, to notice that. Thank you so much. Good. I don't know if there's any other questions. I thought of a tip, I can give a tip if you want. Go ahead, please. <laughs> if you have a tip, go ahead. No, if, you're, if you're part of the 77% of the people on YouTube, listening to music, <laughs> because I am, or I used to be, until I discovered that. Now, there's actually a really nice extension called Audio Only, and uh, you install it, and then it allows you to just have the sound. So if you just want to dig for some special music, or you want to listen to a conference, but you don't need to face it, and that allows you to lower by 50% the, the internet usage. And if you're a venue, um, please give Wi-Fi access, if you can, for free to your audience. That's also like 5 to 20% uh, less impact than if you have your audience use uh, 4G or 5G. So that's also a very good practice and quite easy to implement when you have the means. And you said you're creating guidelines as well, or a guide somehow. And I would wonder, when could we ex expect something that useful and where could we find it? Now we, well, we've been working on that for a year already, but it's, since there are no, not so many studies and uh, you really need to dig into and not to put on false information or something that would be counterproductive. So we are being super careful with that. So it might take, maybe someone else will do it before us and it's quite possible, but. <laughs> Well, make sure you inform us when, when it's of ready <laughs> and good luck with that. I'm just looking around me, seeing if there's anyone else who wants to contribute. Yes. <laughs> um, I have a question that is related to the topic of sustainability, but a little bit outside of the specific topic of mobility. Um, and I guess it's related to this question of climate denialism because I think that Matthew brought up a good, I mean, culture is also about kind of changing mindset and perspective and ways of being in the world. And we've also talked a little bit today how that is increasingly seeming to a lot of people intimately related to the way that politics <laughs> plays out in our world. And I was wondering, um, I haven't heard anyone talk yet about how this in, in, I don't know what the case is in, in Finland. I hope it's not like the place where I grew up, but you, climate denialism as a political force um, is something that I think that we have to contend with at large. Again, it's broader than the question of mobility, but it's still potentially a big force shaping the world at large and also shaping the cultural sector and potentially public funding and stuff like that. And I was wondering if any of you could, could speak to that. Um, as something that you've encountered and what you're thinking about it. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'm not totally sure if you, I understood the question in the right way, but, but uh, uh, I think that, uh, for example, uh, our flagship program, uh, Peace Machine, uh, which wants to create uh, communication, better communication between people who are not agreeing in everything so that we could uh, live on the same globe without wars and, and violent conflicts. Now we, we know what is going on, on in Ukraine and, and 
many other places, uh, war is uh, always an uh, environmental catastrophe. We can still see uh, the scars of Second World War in the North Finland, and it was in in 1940s. So I think that if, if uh, cultural professionals and artists are working uh, to make people more conscious about the questions of, of peace and solving solving uh, conflicts and and uh, uh, trying to to live together side by side although you are not agreeing in everything i think that uh, that is also something which is really really good for our environment and and to the future of human mankind so it's not only that we are calculating that that how much emissions we are making but also the the positive impacts that uh, art and culture can have in our future mm -hmm. so but uh, in that way i'm i'm a really big idealistic mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Katie, for your question. I think you're raising a very important point. Uh, I can only speak about my experience, but um, when, so when I started uh, in 2016, I was going around all the music conventions in Europe, pitching my project, saying we should start to uh, work on that. And I was getting a lot of uh, reactions of people, um, mainly male, I would say, that were telling me like, oh, we don't care about that, this is boring, or some of them even said, like, not a problem, it doesn't exist. And now, uh, it doesn't happen to me anymore. And I don't think it is because it disappeared, but I think it's less uh, acceptable for people to have this kind of uh, speech in public. Or So, I kind of, going back, maybe I kind of preferred when people were actually telling this this to me to my face so i could address it i couldn't change their mind or whatever but at least there was a dialogue a conversation which is not happening anymore so i wonder how we can influence on that and of course artists can can have this power and we were talking yesterday about billy eilish who's now doing those big tours in the uk and really having the the like awareness raising and really uh, but is it like people that are actually uh, climate denials that go there. I'm not so sure. So um, I don't really have an answer, actually, but, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's still a very big question. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Hear me now. There you go. Yeah. So my name is uh, Gear. I'm 180, light skinned, um, blonde here. I work here at uh, Nordic uh, Culture Point on the grant schemes. I just wanted to do some um, Norwegian uh, PR <laughs> in a way. Mm, uh, in Norway, we have uh, 13 ministries uh, within the government like five years ago, and four of them made these green um, roadmaps. And the fifth ministry that did it was the Norwegian Cultural Ministry, so for arts. It's not finished yet, so I encourage all of you to, to contact Norway, contact the different ministries to, to listen to them and how they develop those uh, green um, maps for all the sectors of all the ministries. It's only in Norwegian on all the ministries pages. There is English pages on the ministries, the different ones, but I encourage you to, to bug us and, and contact them for, for uh, guidance on how they started to implement it to uh, out the government and all the ministries so i think it's it's a good way because they quickly before pandemic we all looked to scotland for guidance on how to implement within the arts and that's all good but i think we we there's still uh, 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 quite a road to go to, mm -hmm. to to match all the new things we experienced during the pandemic so so i think yeah, yeah thank that you was so just much. a comment yeah yeah, thank you so much. I think this is really relevant to the whole question about how do we communicate to our policymakers and are there good examples out there? So it would be definitely interesting to look into that. Um, yeah, who else? I see a hand raised over here. And also, it's a good point that you make about resources that are really UK based. Uh, it's a question that I've seen often and there are EU or Europe or 
any other continent based resources out there, but we do tend to look at the UK. So it's really good to share also other examples. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Hello there, Clemeni. I'm afraid it's another UK, a UK voice <laughs> on this. It's good to follow you. Uh, Clemeni Christofaro. Um, I am a female. I am in my 50s. I am white. I have more messier hair than I'd like to have, and I'm wearing a gray, a gray shirt. Um, we, we've been part of a project in the UK uh, working with Julie's Bicycle, which does develop tools for measuring our carbon footprint. It's not, it's not a Julie's Bicycle project, this. And there were three organizations that came together to look at how we might measure our digital carbon footprint. It's a research project working with the University of South Bank, South London, somewhere. Um, and that was a really interesting kind of process. And they came to do a presentation for us in Cyprus. And they were very, uh, very amusing duo. They talked about it very well. They talked about it also in terms of understanding what live streaming is compared to boiling a kettle or doing something else. So the language was super. So they've developed a little tool, which is worth having a look at. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's not fully developed yet, but interesting to understand what an event like this would do, for example. So you can put in the amount of hours and times. It's called the network condition. So maybe I can share it through on, on the move and people can have a look at that. Just quickly on Billie Eilish, as a complete aside, I was looking for animal free testing at uh, the perfume department of the airport. <laughs> and she does a perfume which is animal free. So just to, just to pop that in there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And getting the right tools to calculate and to really have the data. We go back at the end, we go back to the data that we started with because having the, the tools to know what the footprint, what the impact is, is so important to make your decisions. So that's the, the, a key step for all of us to get those tools. And if they, those tools are not available yet, to get them available. I don't know if either one of you would like to respond. Um, I was still thinking about what you said actually and uh, I, I actually had a question for you because <laughs> I don't have uh, any examples in mind but uh, do you think do you have uh, maybe uh, your ministry of environment if it's uh, like this that actually considers also of including culture in the in their plans for uh, climate change and climate crisis uh, is that is that a discussion that is happening also uh, yeah, I'm not probably not the right person to ask, but 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 there were some questions before pandemic about how can the different um, uh, ministries that are actually are already implemented and work more together. But I, I would say the pandemic kind of stopped a lot of those processes, and and the and the green uh, map for art is not done yet. So it's 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 two years since it was supposed to be done. So, but of course, I mean. Norway. I'm from Norway myself, of course, but now I live here in Finland. So, but Norway is a tiny, tiny country. So, I, I would say yes, they do. You know, and they look at each other. And actually, all the green maps are on the same page of the um, current government. So, you know, it's yeah. But but yeah. but I, I just want you. I, I don't know how to say? It. I, I think I don't think uh, the Norwegian government see it as their way that what they have have done and the, what they're doing is relevant for other countries Th and and that's a little bit sad because they're actually doing great work and working much more closely together between the ministries and between the sectors than we ourselves think so it's like the i always call this like the little brother syndrome and they have it here in Finland, and we definitely have it in Norway as well. So <laughs> that's why I said, that's why I use this word, bug them and, and contact them. And if you're a policymaker in another country or have that type of power, if you contact one of the Norwegian ministries, they will reply because they will go, oh, yeah, we have to reply them, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. So use that power. That's my. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Pia, you'd like to. Uh, yes, uh, of course. Our city of Oulu has its own environmental pro program mm -hmm. which was uh, uh, in our city council quite lately so there are many practical things which are uh, happening already in in our city and plans that how can we make everything carbon free in the future there are some issues uh, 
which are bigger in the north, for example, warming warming up the houses because uh, it's uh, we can live without uh, uh, warming maybe four months in a year and um, in other months we need need some kind of, of warming up system and uh, that is maybe the biggest uh, emission source in, in our region. Uh, I think that in our environmental program there are not specific uh, things for the cultural sector but of course everything which has uh, to do with the uh, uh, event venues and uh, logistics, uh, public transportation and uh, everything. It has also importance for, for cultural events. For example, uh, we have a really, really good uh, recycling system in our city. Only less than 1% of uh, all the waste go to the old fashioned waste yard and everything else is, is uh, recycled mm -hmm. in one way or the other, for example, uh, we make uh, gas from organic waste so that there is one bus line which is using uh, that uh, gas which is coming from, from the organic waste and I think that that's uh, really great. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I think this is a good point and um, you know we have been talking a lot about policy actually in this Q&A uh, and it's interesting to look at the different levels of policy as well because you know you have the big uh, international global policymakers. Then, if I look at, at where we are now, uh, the, the EU, uh, the national policy institutions, but you do have the cities, and the cities have, I, I found out uh, but recently that the, a lot of cities have very interesting climate initiatives. And as the cultural sector, it's really interesting to see if we can link to that and how we can do that and try to include by maybe lobbying on a much smaller scale. Um, culture into very local um, policies and action plans of, of, for instance, municipalities. I mean, a lot of cultural organizations are, are strongly rooted in the city that they are based in and can make a difference also there. So there's a lot of different uh, angles towards it. And I think I have to wrap up now. So I'd like to thank all of you and especially our two panelists and On The Move for giving us this uh, stage. Thank you all. Thank you.